Saymel, the propeller shaft and the universal joints are usually out of sight and out of mind. Maybe we ought to give Barney the lowdown on what they do. I think it will help, Tech. The prop shaft vibration in this car can be corrected all right, but I want to be sure that Barney understands why we do the things we're going to do. Hey, what's a wall-fired private? You two in cahoots on something special? Could be, Barney. We were just wondering if you'd go for a good rundown on how the propeller shaft and universal joints do their job. Suits me, Tech. You and Mel haven't given me a bump steer yet. In that case, then, suppose we talk about some basic things. Like why there's a prop shaft and universal joints to begin with. Why, they just tie the transmission and rear axle together. So engine driving power gets to the rear wheels, don't they? Well, the prop shaft is the main link, all right. But the universal joints are the parts that make it possible to connect two shafts in different planes. Power, then, is transmitted through an angle. Another thing, Barney, the transmission is attached to the frame cross member, so the transmission output shaft won't change in relation to the frame. On the other hand, the pinion shaft does change in relation to the frame, and consequently to the output shaft. That happens each time the rear axle moves up or down because of uneven road surfaces. Besides the changing angle of drive, Barney, there's also a slight change in distance between the output and pinion shafts. So the universal joints have to do more than provide a connection throughout various angles. They also have to allow for slight variations in distance between the output and pinion shafts. Our cars, incidentally, use two kinds of universal joints. One is the ball and trunnion type. The other is the cross type. Give Barney the details, Mel. Okay, the ball and trunnion design is an enclosed joint. It has a body, a trunnion pin, two steel balls with needle bearings, thrust washers, and centering buttons. The ball head for the trunnion pin is a built-in part of the prop shaft. The pin is a press fit in the ball head and is accurately centered, so each end extends the same distance. If that pin is off-center by as little as three thousandths of an inch, Barney, it can cause the shaft to run out of balance. Might be a cause of vibration, right? Yep. Now, the steel balls mounted on the pin ends run on needle bearings. Thrust washers between the bearings and prop shaft ball head soak up any side thrust. Centering buttons and spring washers help center the pin in the body. The steel balls work in smooth raceways in the joint body. They slide back and forth as the prop shaft changes length. Nothing complicated about that, Mel. How's that other type of joint differ? Well, it has a yoke, a cross, two roller bearings and bushing assemblies, two roller bearing and block assemblies, dust seals and retainers. A sliding spline connection is provided between the prop shaft and the joint. This compensates for variations in distance between the output shaft and the pinion shaft. On all cars but Imperials, you'll find a one-piece shaft with a ball and trunnion joint at the front and a cross-type joint at the rear. I gotcha. Fine. Now, Barney, let's talk about prop shaft angle and why it's so important. Remember, the transmission output shaft and rear axle pinion shaft are in different planes. Because of this, the universal joints must work through an angle. Just how much of an angle is very important. So all working parts of the joint will have maximum life. In other words, no angle or one that's too slight would not permit proper lubrication. This would lead to early wear of the joint parts. Yeah. And too great an angle would cause vibration. So you have to use an angle that will give long life and trouble-free performance. Just what is the right working angle? Uh, one to three degrees, with two degrees preferred. That's the angle specified for all cars with either the single or two-piece propeller shaft. I noticed this Imperial uses a two-piece shaft and three joints. Yeah, and uh, those are cross-type joints, Barney. How come the Imperial uses a two-piece shaft, Mel? That's because of its long wheelbase. Look at it this way. To use a single prop shaft on a long wheelbase vehicle, you'd have to make the shaft larger in diameter. That's necessary to give the shaft enough strength 
to prevent whipping at high speeds. But when you go to too large a diameter, you're very apt to introduce more vibrations. There's more mass to rotate, for one thing. Also, it's very difficult to balance a longer, thicker shaft. Oh, then a two-piece shaft helps to eliminate vibrations. It does that, if the working angles are correct. The center joint angle can be adjusted by adding or removing shims at the center bearing support. This makes it easy to get the right working angle at the center joint. You might also have to install tapered shims between the rear springs and saddles on the rear axle, Barney. That's to get the proper angle at the rear joint. I think I follow that. But I've got some questions. How do you know the vibration in this Imperial comes from the prop shaft? Also, how can you tell when it's a shaft that's out of balance or just a case of the wrong working angle? Well, that's where your road test comes in, Barney. Make one each time you get a report of vibration. Okay. Uh, what should I watch out for? Well, first, see if there's any shaft roughness that starts from three miles an hour, say, as soon as the car gets underway, and continues into the higher speed ranges. This usually means lack of lubrication in the joints, or excessive wear, or even a Brunel joint. Now, a vibration between 15 and 20 miles an hour is what my road test turned up on this car. Experience shows that a vibration at this speed is apt to be caused by prop shaft misalignment rather than unbalance. If the vibration had come in at speeds above 28 miles an hour, I'd have suspected an unbalanced condition. On the road too, Barney, try to tell whether the vibration is light, moderate, or heavy. The lighter it is, the more nearly correct the prop shaft angle or balance is. Not as much correction will be needed. I got gotcha. you. The heavier the vibrations, the more angle correcting or balancing I'll have to do. That's the idea. Now, as a reminder, the vibrations that show up between 15 and 20 miles an hour are usually due to misalignment on cars with a two-piece shaft, like this Imperial. Later on, we'll talk about single shaft diagnosis. Okay, Mel, I understand. And say, before you check into the shaft angle, look for other vibration possibilities. For example, the universal joint flange bolts might be loose. The parking brake drum might be out of balance. Or the rear engine mount could be loose. Another thing, check for undercoating overspray on the propeller shaft or parking brake drum. That's enough to cause an out of balance condition. This shaft and drum look pretty clean. There's no sign of overspray, Mel. Fine. I know the joint flange bolts are tight and the rear engine mount is tight, so we'll check the angle next. Uh, before you do that, fellas, somebody please turn this record over. Now, when you check working angles, there must be no extra weight in the car or luggage compartment. The gas tank should be at least three quarters full, and the weight of the car must rest on the wheels. Next, we check phasing of the center universal joint. The letter O on the front face of the yoke should line up with the keyway in the rear end of the front shaft. Back off the oil seal cap about a half inch so you can see the keyway. If the joint were out of phase, you'd have to disconnect the rear shaft and index the splines properly. Well, that's not our trouble here. The letter O is in line with the keyway, all right. Fine. Then, with this spirit level protractor, measure the angle of the rear propeller shaft. Put the protractor on the underside of the shaft, parallel with the shaft. Then adjust the bubble so it's centered in the glass and read how many degrees the shaft slants down towards the rear from a horizontal position. It looks like two degrees. Yeah, and after that, disconnect the shaft at the pinion shaft. Put the spirit level against the front face of the companion flange with its long dimensional vertical and center the bubble. Looks like the pinion shaft slopes down about two and a half degrees. Now add your two readings and you get the working angle of the rear joint. Easy. Four and a half degrees. But you said we shouldn't go over three degrees, didn't you? Yeah, Barney. So you got some work to do. But it's easy. Mel can tell you what to do to reduce the working angle. Sure, Barney. You install a tapered shim between the rear spring and its saddle to bring the working angle within limits. 
Keep the flat side of the shim with the rounded edge toward the spring and the thick end pointing forward. Is that all? No, after you install the shim, you should recheck the rear flange angle. This is mighty important because you want to know that the angle is within limits. In addition, you'll probably have to shim at the struts. Just loosen the attaching bolts and add shims until the struts are free and unloaded. This releases the load on the rear axle and allows it to assume the proper angle. Okay, will do. That makes a difference, too. Now my figures show a rear joint working angle of two and three quarter degrees. Is that within limits? It sure is, Barney. And it's a good clue to what the center joint working angle ought to be. Tech's right. There's a definite tie-in between the rear and center joint working angles. Both must team up for smooth, quiet, efficient operation. And this chart shows the relationship. Reading up from two and three quarters degrees to the shaded section, showing the high and low limits, and then out to the left, indicates our center joint angle should be one degree. Let's check that. Our reading on the underside of the front shaft is one degree. Our reading at the rear shaft was two degrees. To find the center joint working angle, when the front and rear shafts slope in the same direction as they do here, you subtract your readings. One from two leaves one, which agrees with our chart. Whenever both shafts slope in opposite directions, you add your readings. I see. So we're all right on this job. But if the angle were wrong, how would you change it? Just add or remove these 1 16th shims between the center support insulator and cross member. One of those shims will change the angle about a quarter degree. I see. So if the angle's too low, I'd add shims to increase it. And if the angle is too great, I'd remove shims to cut it down. That's the idea, Barney. But remember, if you add or remove very many shims at that point, be sure to recheck the rear joint angle. It will change some, but you want to make sure it stays within the one to three degree limits. Okay, I'll keep that point in mind. There's a new gauge you can use to check prop shaft angles on Imperials. It's an aligning gauge which lets you make direct readings. And there's a story on its use in this reference book. Tech's right, that gauge saves time on prop shaft checking because you don't have to add or subtract angles. Sounds great. Have we got one of them on order? Naturally. Don't we always get the latest special tools? Now look, when you get this job buttoned up, we'll road test this car and see if changing the prop shaft angle eliminated the vibration. And if they all turn out as good as this one, I think I can handle the two-piece shaft angles without too much trouble. Working on the one-piece shaft is also fairly simple, Barney. Mel can give you the dope on that. Well, when you road test a car with a one-piece shaft, a vibration due to an incorrect angle will come in at a higher speed than it did on the Imperial. In fact, if the vibration shows up between 30 and 35 miles an hour, chances are it's because the rear joint working angle isn't right. If there's vibration between 65 and 70, and the wheels have been balanced, it's probably due to an unbalanced shaft. You diagnose and start checking for other possibilities on the one-piece shafts, the same as you did on the Imperial two-piece job, Barney. Just the speed ranges are higher, huh? That's right. You check the rear joint angle with a protractor, just the same as you did on the Imperial. I see. Check the angle of the shaft first, huh? Then the pinion shaft. Right. Find the working angle. Then correct it, if necessary, by shims at the rear spring saddles. Then recheck the angle. Okay, that sounds easy enough. But didn't you say a lot of this information applies to trucks as well as cars? It fits trucks like a glove, my boy. Because of a longer wheelbase, trucks frequently use a two-piece shaft. In some cases, you might even find a three-piece shaft. In the case of a three-piece shaft, you'll find a bearing bracket at the rear of the front and the center shafts. I see. Similar to the two-piece shaft arrangement. Yeah, but the angle story on trucks is different. Right. Trucks perform better when the drive line from the transmission to the rear axle is fairly straight, with as low a working angle as possible. Right. 
You'll often find the pinion shaft of a truck tilted up slightly at the front instead of down. Reduces the working angle of the rear joint. Uh-huh. I see. Checking working angles and the alignment of the yokes during assembly is pretty much the same as in passenger car service. You'll find the details in the reference book. Good. I think I can handle this type of service now. Frankly, I feel a lot better about the whole prop shaft story. Glad to hear it, Barney. The more Mel and I can help you, the more you'll help keep our customers bringing their business to us. They'll not only stay sold on our products, but it will also help keep you and me in pancakes. <laughs>